Tonight, a real-life treasure item being plundered by the loggers' axe. The reality is that if the Malagasy government were appropriately managing its forests, they could be making more money in the long term. Also, in forests being cleared, one-of-a-kind creatures try to hang on for survival. If somebody didn't do something about saving those creatures, they'd be gone forever and just be fossils. And New England sparks a revolution, this time in the way we eat. Like the phone is ringing off the frickin' hook. People in communities all over the U.S. and Canada are hungry for this kind of inspiration, these ideas, this story. We'll bring you the news tonight on Dan Rather Report. Good evening. Tonight we take you on an adventure halfway around the globe to the island of Madagascar off the coast of Africa. But you won't find lions, giraffes, or elephants here. Madagascar's strange and colorful wildlife evolved in isolation. It's a place like no other. You will see these animals tonight, some captured in vivid high definition for the first time, and maybe the last. Our investigation uncovered how an international black market is driving these endangered natural wonders toward extinction. These pictures have never been seen on television before. They show what international law enforcement, the American government, and conservationists around the globe say is an ecological nightmare. Madagascar's national parks are being plundered. These makeshift camps inside the forest house thousands of locals who are illegally chopping down rare and extremely valuable rosewood trees. Each of these trees is worth thousands of dollars on the international market, but the desperate residents of Madagascar are cutting them down for just a few dollars a day. This amateur video was recorded as part of an investigation by two international conservation groups. Ultimately, they hope American prosecutors will use this footage to criminally charge those who are buying Madagascar rosewood. Things are bad. Things are not pretty in Madagascar right now. Andrea Johnson works for the Environmental Investigation Agency, or EIA, one of the conservation groups that organized this investigation on behalf of Madagascar's national parks. In recent months, she has been closely monitoring a sudden spike in Madagascar's precious wood trade. It's not as though there was never illegal logging before 2009, but the situation since the coup in February of 09 has made everything a whole lot worse. That's when dozens of people died as the military opened fire into a crowd, unleashing panic across the country. The military went on to oust the country's president. Chaos reigned and the economy dissolved. Impoverished people looking to make quick money streamed into the national parks to pirate away the rosewood. The majority of rosewood globally is used for high-end products. And the other big sector in which these woods are used is the musical instrument sector. And rosewood is commonly used in guitars. The international community is just now waking up to Madagascar's logging problems. But the island has been attracting a certain kind of worldwide attention for decades. The lush jungles and unique wildlife have long made Madagascar a mecca for scientific study. Anthropologist Patricia Wright has been coming to this isolated island for 25 years to study the wildlife. Her expertise is primates, but she soon fell in love with the forests, the people, and the land itself. Originally, I studied in South America, in the Amazon. I was very interested in primates and how their behavior is like ours. And then when I got to Madagascar, it was an intriguing place because it is like a, a treasure island. Do you consider it a magical place? Mm, yes. You have these strange plants that look like they're from a different planet. And you have these wonderful animals that are just like nothing else on Earth. So it, it is sort of like a magic kingdom in a way. 
Madagascar lies just 250 miles off the southeastern African coast, but because it is separated from the continent by deep seas and strong trade winds, the island's creatures evolved in total isolation. At least 70% of Madagascar's plants and animals can be found nowhere else on Earth. Many of these one-of-a-kind species are threatened, including the island's most famous inhabitants, the lemurs. Lemurs are primates, scientifically, just like humans. They're a diverse bunch, some as small as a mouse, others as big as a dog. They're also very rare, but that wasn't always the case. Lemurs evolved about 60 million years ago. But when people arrived on their island just 2,000 years ago, things began to get ugly. 90% of the rainforest and all of the habitat where lemurs lived before has been destroyed in the last couple thousand years. And so for me, it was seeing creatures like nowhere else on Earth and then realizing that if somebody didn't do something about saving those creatures, they'd be gone forever and just be fossils. Wright, a professor at the State University of New York at Stony Brook, is trying to save the lemurs by bringing together foreign scientists, tourists, and the people of Madagascar, known as the Malagasy. In 1991, Wright spearheaded the establishment of a national park and research center where she teaches the locals how to make a living from conservation and ecotourism instead of exploiting the land and its forests. It's a model that other scientists are looking to follow. Scientists like Eric Patel. Patel is a doctoral candidate at Cornell University. He got his start in Wright's National Park, but when he saw pictures of very unique lemurs that lived in another part of the country, he was smitten. I learned that there were still a couple lemur species that had never been studied. And I was just kind of stunned by how gorgeous they were. I mean, they're, you know, white puffballs. They're beautiful animals. And I was also stunned by how rare they were. It was just hard to believe how few remained. Since 2001, Patel has made dozens of trips to Madagascar to study these silky safaka lemurs and find a way to save them from extinction. These elusive creatures have become his life's work. They move so acrobatically and so elegantly that, that we joke around that they're superheroes. And in a way, they are superheroes in that they're not extinct yet. Any animal that is teetering so close to being gone uh, deserves superhero status. The Silkies live in and around Merojeji National Park, a world heritage site in northeast Madagascar. Patel is trying to protect them by establishing the same kind of eco-economy in Merojeji that Patricia Wright did in her national park. It gives Patel a unique job, part lemur scientist and part grassroots organizer. There you can see her ear. Look at her right ear. The right ear is the one that's cut. Patel employs Malagasy men to help him track and monitor the lemurs which in turn gives them the skills to guide and interpret for paying tourists. A lot of people are benefiting from tourists here. Researchers and tourists support conservation of Marojeji in a variety of ways, hiring porters to carry luggage and food up the mountain, uh, research guides. All tourists entering the park are required to have one or two research guides and a cook. This does have a trickle-down effect. Patel hopes that if these men are able to earn a living from the national park, they will help protect it and not cut it down. He pays everyone who works for him a good wage, between seven and $20 a day. Steady jobs like these at Marojeji are elusive for most rural Malagasy. Patel believes he must try to save Madagascar as well as study it. And that pleases Professor Wright. Tell us about Eric Patel. Why is the work that he's doing important? Well, Eric is learning the, the daily lifestyle of the Silky Shafak. However, he's also been doing some extraordinary conservation work. He's hired local people, he's been training local people so that they will understand and appreciate the wildlife like he does. But he's up against some tough challenges. 
Patel is starting to uncover troubling clues of rosewood logging deep inside Marajeji National Park. This wide path into the woods is a new trail cut by the loggers to get to the precious trees. And Mosesi, a park naturalist, discovers something alarming. A logger had cut into the trunk of this tree looking for the deep red core of rosewood. This is not a uh, rosewood, but uh, it is the same family. They think it was the uh, rosewood. That's why they had uh, tried to cut it, but finally they had seen that it is another tree. It was uh, lucky. <laughs> There was a time when the rule of law protected rosewood trees in the national parks. But with the government in disarray, loggers are making their mark and the tourists have stopped coming. Even before the political coup, only about 300 hearty souls made the trip to Marajeji each year. The park is remote, even by Madagascar standards. Travelers must start out in Antananarivo the country's troubled but picturesque capital. It was once a French colonial city and some of that spirit still remains. From the capital, it's an hour-long plane flight over clearings that used to be forests. That's followed by a long drive through poor rural villages to get to the park. And that's just the beginning. To see the rare silky Sifaka lemurs, ambitious visitors climb on a treacherous trail for hours through a dense, wet jungle. This summer, we sent a cameraman and a reporter to join Patel when he went to check on a particular group of Silkies that live near a research camp at the center of the park. On the way in, they hear some troubling news. Uh, we'd actually heard a rumor that one of the infants may have been killed during the Rosewood fiasco. We're not sure if that's actually true now. We're still looking for the infants. We haven't found them yet. Mosesi and Desiree, another park naturalist, stopped to show Patel a giant rosewood tree that had, so far, escaped the loggers' axes. The guides estimated the tree was about 75 feet tall and 600 years old. It is a very strong wood, wow. so uh, it needs many, many years to be like this. Yeah. Wow. Mosesi and Desiree's sharp eyes spotted all sorts of bizarre wildlife along the way. They live just a few miles from the park and have acquired a lifetime of knowledge about the flora and fauna. The country and Marajeji National Park in particular is one of the most biologically diverse places on Earth. for a good six and a half hours in a hot, hot day. I feel great, I love it here. And uh, we're all in one piece, we're on schedule, and it's not raining. So odds are good that we'll have the silkies tomorrow, but uh, until we get up there, we can't know for sure, but I'm very optimistic. In the morning, Patel and his crew lead our cameraman and reporter out into the jungle to search for the lemur group and make sure that the infants born less than a year ago are alive. Conducting scientific research in this environment isn't easy. I've worked at about five other field sites in Madagascar, and without question, this is the hardest. We don't have animals with radio collars. We don't have a, uh, an established trail system. You know, it's us and the animals in the forest, and it's steep. It's steep as, as all hell. The foliage is so thick in the rainforest, it can be hard to see other people just a few feet away, much less a cat-sized lemur 50 feet up in the trees. Silky safakas are stealthy and quiet, almost like phantoms of the forest. In truth, the word lemur is from the Latin word for ghost. And that's exactly what Patel thought they were on his first trip to Marajeji. They were completely not accustomed to being observed by humans, and they fled from us for weeks. 
Um, the first time we saw them, they kind of passed by like ghosts. But on this trip, it doesn't take long for Patel's talented trackers to find the Selkies. Silkies are gentle creatures. Patel says they hardly ever fight. They are among the rarest mammals on Earth. Patel estimates there are fewer than 1,000 and maybe only 100 left. In the quiet isolation of the rainforest, it's hard to imagine these animals are severely threatened. But Madagascar's population is exploding. Women have on average five children and farmland is scarce. Rice fields touch the park's borders, and almost all the forests surrounding Marajeji have been cut down. 150 years ago, the lemurs could be found in forests stretching more than 30 miles north. Now, they are slowly being confined to the park. If the stress of a burgeoning population weren't enough, now the silkies are being threatened by loggers. The Environmental Investigation Agency also got graphic images of fallen trees and rosewood stumps in Marojeji. You have both direct and indirect consequences of felling in national parks. On a direct level, you have the impact from the extraction of individual trees, and that involves not only the felling of the tree itself, but probably another three or four trees for every one tree of rosewood that's felled. Logging is low-tech, back-breaking work. Rosewood grows in locations unreachable by heavy equipment. After cutting the trees with hand axes, teams of men drag the extremely heavy logs to the nearest river. A single log can weigh as much as a ton. The logs are so dense, they sink. Trees are taken out in log rafts, and those log rafts are constructed from other trees. So you have a lot of associated damage. Finally, the men load the logs onto trucks or tractors and drive them to a port town. The people who cut and haul these giant logs are paid about $5 a day, a large sum in a place where the median daily wage is less than $1. Then you have the impacts of over a thousand people right now in the national park. They're hunting in the parks. There's a lot of reports that they're shooting lemurs for food. Although lemurs have traditionally been a food source in Madagascar, most lemurs now live inside protected areas where hunting is not allowed. But gangs of hungry loggers have changed that. And they've also scared away the tourists. Because of the logging, Merjeji was closed for two months this spring. But even after the park reopened, Patel saw just one group of tourists during his trip a family from France who were big fans of the lemurs they saw. It's like a human can touch you and you have nearly the same number of fingers. You see, you understand that it's not far from human. And with no visitors, the campsites in Merjeji stood empty. In 2008, tourism was the highest grossing industry in Madagascar, bringing in $390 million. But this year will be different. I was just back in Madagascar and visiting some of the national parks and it's been devastating for them because where they were all many people like hundreds and hundreds of people around each park are making a good living off of tourism but in this year everybody has stayed clear of Madagascar because of the political turmoil and that means no funding for people, no salaries, no money coming for families. It's very, very difficult for them. After a long day in the forest, Patel's guides and porters tell him they are being threatened by the loggers in the park. Babazi, a porter and a local policeman, says the entire village police force, except for him, 11 officers in all, were involved with the illegal logging of Rosewood. What is the risk if the rosewood timber logging continues at or near its present pace? Well, one thing about Madagascar is if you destroy all its natural resources, 
That is not good for the lemurs, but it's really not good for the population either, for the people. When we return, our investigation will tell you where all this precious wood and money is going. So stick here with us. Missed an edition of Dan Rather Reports? Or just want to see one again? We're now available on iTunes. So check us out. You've seen tonight how the timber industry is threatening Madagascar's endangered wildlife and with it, the hopes for a tourist-based economy. But expensive trees aren't the only natural resource found on this island roughly the size of Texas. Madagascar is blessed with abundant gemstone and mineral reserves, everything from amethyst to zinc. People started sifting through the red soil, searching for treasure, almost as soon as they set foot on the island 2,000 years ago. But in recent years, foreign mining giants have come here looking to strike gold or one of the other countless valuable minerals on an industrial scale. This wide, muddy road wasn't here a couple of years ago. It was built by a consortium of foreign mining companies led by the Canadian company, Sherritt International Corporation. The road is part of a massive mining and pipeline project that the companies say will provide jobs for the local population and help the economy. But scientists and environmental activists say the ecological impact could be devastating. Right now we are driving on the pipeline trajectory in between Andasi Bay and Ambatuvi, the actual uh, mine site. Reiner Dolch is a German ecologist who runs a conservation and research organization near the construction. He traveled with our reporters on the newly built road towards what is going to be the largest nickel and cobalt mine in the world. I think it's very sad because, uh, as you can see, there is a lot of destruction going on. It has to be said that uh, the surrounding vegetation, if we look at that, is mostly degraded already. So that's basically why the mining company says it's only a minor impact to have a pipeline cut through here. But then as we go further towards the mine side, there is tracts and areas of primary rainforest. We wanted to see the 3,000 acre nickel mine up close, but we were stopped by company authorities and escorted away. Turned back from the mine, we headed on foot into the surrounding jungle to see what could be at risk from the massive construction project. Dote sent our reporters deep into the forest with some of his best lemur trackers. Dolch's organization had fitted several members of a rare species of lemur with radio collars. Tina, one of the trackers, used an antenna to get a basic idea of which direction to go to find them. Along the way, Tina found gnawed bamboo shoots, a clear indication that the animal had been here recently. After five hours of hiking up muddy hills and across streams, our crew was able to record the first ever high-definition images of the greater bamboo lemur. They're named after their only food source, and they seemed a bit confused by the sudden appearance of people. Dolch first saw this group of greater bamboo lemurs in 2007 in a forest very near to the nickel mine site. The discovery sent ripples of awe through the lemur research community. This lemur hadn't been spotted in this part of the country for years. There's probably as few as 120, 130 individuals remaining in the wild. And our current estimates for the population that we found is about 40 to 50 animals. So that's probably the majority of the animals that we know of. One of the scientists excited by Dolce's discovery was Patricia Wright. Because they eat bamboo, and only giant bamboo, and giant bamboo is, is only found in certain areas within the rainforest, they're rare. They're rare wherever they are. And so I was worried that uh, there might not be enough left to keep the populations going. 
25 years ago, Dr. Wright thought that the greater bamboo lemur was actually extinct. In 1986, she found a small group living in an inland forest. She fought to create a national park to protect her rare research subjects. But the group of greater bamboo lemurs that Reiner Dolch found is in an ecological war zone. There is the Ambatuvi nickel mine to the west, and there is smaller graphite mining operations to the east. And uh, these greater bamboo lemur groups are just in between in a forest area that has no protection status yet. The pipeline that Sherritt, the mining company, is building will pump a nickel and cobalt slurry 130 miles from the mountain mine to a processing center on the coast. Dolch worries that the construction swath may be separating the newly discovered greater bamboo lemurs from their dwindling food source. If these faraway places are actually not reachable anymore because the pipeline is cutting through the habitat, then this could have implications on lemur survival. We talked about the threat of increased logging to the lemur population. What about mining? What effect does it have? Mining has turned out to be a threat to lemurs also. And that's no, is because... That mines are, they're underground. The yes, they are, are underground, but in order to get to the cobalt nickel, they have to get to underground. And if there's forest on top of the ground, then the, the, what's happening is that forest is disappearing. They are cutting it down. In addition to turning us away from the mine, Sherritt declined multiple requests to speak to us on camera. They gave us a helicopter tour of the pipeline and told us that they had constructed, quote, lemur bridges to allow the animals to cross above the construction zones. But they declined to show us any of these structures. Sherritt plans to start extracting minerals sometime in 2010. They project that the mine will produce for about 30 years. It remains to be seen if the lemurs will survive that long. Meanwhile, the greater bamboo lemurs seem blissfully unaware that their very existence hangs in the balance. Part of the tragedy of logging and mining in Madagascar is that the local people who work so hard to extract these natural resources see little of any economic windfall. For the most part, it is foreigners who are making the big money. All of the nickel and cobalt that Sherritt pulls out of the ground in Madagascar will be shipped elsewhere to be turned into products. The same goes for the precious timber. All the rosewood that is taken from Madagascar's forests is loaded as whole logs into containers and shipped abroad. But it doesn't have to be that way. According to a report submitted to Madagascar's government by Andrea Johnson and the Environmental Investigation Agency, regulated logging could have huge benefits if handled correctly. The reality is that if the Malagasy government were appropriately managing its forests, they could be making more money in the long term from sustainable management of their forests. In May, the new post-coup government sent a signal that they wanted to stop the illegal logging and dispatched a handful of military troops and police to Marajeji National Park. These officers were stationed in the village of Medina, just outside the park's boundaries. They said they had caught many people dragging wood out of the forest and kept a large rosewood log in the village square as proof of their success. <laughs> The officers said that they had stopped the illegal logging in the 148,000 acre park, but this seemed unlikely given the amount of wood openly stockpiled around the region. We wanted to know who was making money from the illegal logging trade and where the wood was going, so our investigation took us from the forests to the coast. This pile of more than 200 rosewood logs was visible from the street in the port town of Antalaha. It belongs to Martin Baymatana, one of at least a dozen rosewood exporters in Madagascar. He admitted people were cutting trees in the national parks during the time of the political unrest. 
He told us it was not illegal to exploit rosewood in the national parks during the political coup because, he said, there was no government and no laws at the time. Bematana lives just across the street from his log storage yard in a large, well-cared-for compound. And he readily acknowledges that rosewood exporting is very profitable. Each log will sell for more than $2,500. Per capita income in Madagascar is just $410 a year. Madagascar rosewood is considered a high quality hardwood and very attractive due to its unusual deep red color. And Bematana says he sells all his rosewood to three Chinese clients. The demand is insatiable. <laughs> Andrea Johnson has found that almost all the rosewood leaving Madagascar now is going to China, where ornately carved rosewood furniture has been popular for centuries. And with the rosewood all but stripped from Chinese forests, the country is turning its attention to Madagascar. We estimate that in 2009, there's been at least 7,000 cubic meters of rosewood that have left Madagascar. The value is at least $20 million. It's not staying in Madagascar. It's leaving. It's all this is all this is an entirely export oriented trade. Johnson says the rosewood industry in Madagascar is run by a handful of rich and politically powerful dealers. This September, they convinced the government to contradict its own laws and allow rosewood to be exported. The government announced rosewood could leave the ports after the exporters paid a fine of about $36,000 per container. So what they're doing is instead of seizing the illegal wood, they're saying to the traders, okay, we sort of know what's going on here. Just pay us a fine and we'll let this continue. We requested an interview with the Madagascar government, but they never responded. The United States is starting to crack down on the trade in illegal wood. Last year, Congress amended a law covering the movement of plants and animals across America's borders to include lumber, such as rosewood, from Madagascar. Basically, what it says is, if you have reason to believe that there are some sketchy dealings on the source end of your wood products, you might be better off not importing them, not bringing them into the country. Johnson suspects some American companies are buying Madagascar rosewood nonetheless. That's why her organization is documenting the illegal logging with video evidence such as this. They plan to turn over what they find to U.S. law enforcement. Back in the forest of Marajeji National Park, it's before sunrise, and researcher Eric Patel has yet to find the baby silky safaka lemurs he fears may have been casualties of the rosewood logging. He sends several groggy researchers out to where they had left the Silkies the night before to try again to find the missing youngsters. Again, the trackers locate the group, and Patel finally sees one of the two young lemurs. He never found the other one. It's hard for a, a silky safaka infant to survive. And we've lost a lot over the years. We're really worried about them. They're so rare. I mean, they, they don't survive in zoos. It's not likely we'll be able to breed them in zoos in the near future. It's really the silky safakas here in Marojeji in the high, high mountains that might be the last hope in, in 100 years. Patel may never know what happened to the missing baby silky safaka lemur. It's impossible to prove that it's a victim of the logging. But losing a baby is a tough blow for Patel and the effort to save this endangered species. We knew this place was special, and we knew this animal was special. But in the end, I think everyone wants to feel like they're doing something for the greater good, like there's some kind of greater 
benefit to your research. And we felt that here. You know, we kind of feel like um, this is our last stand here in Marojeji. And there are signs that Eric Patel's warnings are gaining an audience. The United States House of Representatives recently passed a resolution condemning the illegal logging in Madagascar's national parks. When we return on this program, something different. We leave behind the global trade in lumber for the local trade in produce. An experiment in what we eat, coming up next. Welcome back. We'll soon all be gathering together for holiday feasts with family and friends, and most of us will rely on the convenience of a supermarket stocked with ingredients supplied by a global food system. But from the new White House vegetable garden, to farmers markets, to rethinking school lunches, we as a nation are starting to question where we get our food and what we eat. In a down-on-its-luck old Vermont mining town, those questions have sprouted into a living experiment in what they call a 21st century food system. And that means transforming their little town into a community-wide farming circle where everything from soil to seed, crop to compost, is connected. This global food system is killing our planet, killing our communities, and literally killing us. We need to completely retool it. It's based on a processed product. It's based on product flowing thousands of miles from one place to another. There's, there's no way you can start factoring in airplanes shipping food around and say that that's not a carbon footprint nightmare. We need to get back on track of where we were 50 years ago and go back to models and paradigms that actually worked for us. And, and in order for us to build these robust and highly durable local food systems, we've got to get back to an ecosystem modeling strategy. One of the most important things that we share when people arrive here is talking about the Greater Hardwick Food System and how we feed ourselves. I mean, you've got to have good soils that are protected and available to farmers. You've got to have great seeds, like high mowing seeds, that can actually be planted in there. You have to have wonderful farmers that actually use the land in a way that is good for many generations and good for a particular growing season. Value added, like up at Jasper Hill Cheese Caves, where you have wonderful opportunities to take the cheese that's produced locally and then age it and get it onto the market. And the market is everything from the Buffalo Mountain Co-op to CSA's Community Supportive Agriculture, such as at Pete's Greens and other places. Also get it on the tables of restaurants and in our own homes. And finally, what's left over, what do we do? We compost it. We close the loop, compost whatever is left over from the food that is not consumed, put it back in the soil, and the entire system starts over again. That, in essence, is a local food system, and one which is operating today very, very appropriately uh, in the Hardwick and the surrounding communities. My name is Monty Fisher. I'm the executive director of the Center for an Agricultural Economy, located in downtown Hardwick, Vermont, uh, on Main Street, uh, between Claire's Restaurant on one side, Buffalo Mountain Co-op on the other side. We're a nonprofit organization that's been in existence for a couple of years. We're an educational part of what's happening in the local food system in Hardwick. Our goal, our motto is really to have as many people locally growing their own food, producing their own food, then eating their own food as much as possible that is grown here, and whatever extra food that's grown, export it to markets within as close as possible, but basically the New England, New York food shed. You know, we're building a new rural economy in this area, and we are the growth economy around here. There isn't really a lot else for industry or, or booming businesses. You know, you could decide to eat locally just because you want to help reinvigorate your local area. My name is Pete Johnson. I run this farm called Pete's Greens here in Craftsbury Village. It's uh, in Vermont's Northeast Kingdom, a little bit north of Hardwick. Oh, we grow a lot of baby greens. You can see baby greens around us here. That's how we started and that's still sort of our bread and butter. We grow a lot of storage crops, potatoes, carrots, beets, cabbage. We can provide those every day of the year now. And our goal is to have the greatest vegetable diversity possible for as much of the year as possible 
in this challenging climate that we live in here. You know, we, we can get frost in both June and August around here. So that's a short season. You have to really be nailing things all the way along because you don't have a lot of second chances. Jump! Jump! There's probably 25 or 30 small small farms in the area. We, we have pushed the outer limits of the seasons more than anybody else. And so we have things available during times of the year when the other farms in this area don't. And we think that's really important. We think it's, you know, if we're really serious about eating locally, you have to be able to eat locally every day of the year. And this is a beautiful, beautiful variety. All of them perfect. Gorgeous, straight, very similar shape. But this is so sweet and so tender. This year we've grown about uh, 40 or 50 different varieties of carrots and evaluated them all with each other. My name's Tom Stearns. I started High Mowing Organic Seeds. We sell to a lot of advanced growers and real professional gardeners. And so we need to intimately know how all these varieties work and perform. And that includes colored ones, purple, lemon yellow colored, obviously lots of orange ones, some red ones, some pink ones, some white ones, you name it. I feel like orange ones the best, though. I, I think very few people think about seeds. So when you get up in the morning and you put some clothes on, that's probably some cotton. That was grown from a cotton plant, which needed to be a seed first that was planted, and that seed needed to be grown and developed and selected to have certain traits, to be resistant to this disease or to grow well in this particular climate or whatever. So we are all wearing benefits of seeds all the time. Okay, then you come to breakfast, and you sit down and you have your breakfast, whatever it might be. Corn flakes. Okay, so corn flakes are made with corn. And, of course, that had to be grown. A seed needed to be developed for that. That seed needed to get cleaned on seed cleaning equipment. It needed to be bred and developed, again, to have certain traits to grow in this climate or that climate or whatever it might be. And so when you go into a garden center and you see a seed rack display with all those small little packets, what stands behind those little packets is all of the farming, the collecting of that seed, the harvesting, the cleaning of it, the testing of it to make sure that it germinates well. And if it's a new variety, it maybe took 10 years to develop that variety. I don't mean in a lab somewhere. I mean out in the field, growing it and selecting the plants that do the best or have the traits you're looking for. So we do all of that here. There's the seed. It's got a nice clear hilum, which is that spot. It doesn't have any darkness at all. And for soy milk and for tofu, that's what you're looking for. So this trial here is with the University of Vermont and the Vermont Soy Company. My name's Andrew Meyer, and I'm co-owner of Vermont Soy. We make a line of organic soy products, and also owner of Vermont Natural Coatings, which we make a line of environmentally safe wood finishes. After graduating from the University of Vermont, I had spent time on our own family farm. I went to Washington, D.C. and did agricultural policy for uh, Senator Jim Jeffords for several years. And while I was there, I worked on a lot of the national policy issues impacting agriculture on, on national farm bills. But also, um, the concentration really was, what's going to help Vermont? What is the future of Vermont agriculture going to be? And, I, and it became very clear to me uh, that if we wait for policy to set the future of Vermont, we're, 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 we're going to be in big trouble. So it was kind of that jump to say, let's just go do it moved back to Vermont and, and started. We're here at the production facility for Vermont Natural Coatings where we use a whey-based uh, formulation to make an environmentally safe wood finish. This whey is a byproduct of cheese and we're in the middle of cheese country here in Vermont and it's uh, our goal to source that whey locally so we can help stimulate the, the local artists and cheese makers. That process will start releasing some of the whey and get the curd to firm up so that it's easier to cut into smaller pieces. My name is Andy Keeler. I am one of the founders and president of Jasper Hill Farm and a managing member of the Cellars at Jasper Hill, located in Greensboro, Vermont, which is the next town north of Hardwick. 
1998, my brother Mateo and I purchased an abandoned dairy farm. The year that we purchased our farm, Greensboro lost 30% of its dairies in that one year. Dairy farming is the heart of our community. It's the fabric of the economy around here, and it was a major blow to the community. So we took a look at this as a community development ag viability project. If you can figure out how to make a decent living milking cows, we figured it was going to help maintain our community, maintain the working landscape, the patchwork of fields and farms that make this place beautiful, and made us make the decision that this is where we wanted to raise our kids. You don't do this to make a lot of money. You do this for uh, the meaningfulness, to be connected to the landscape, uh, to be connected to the community. Well, you know, it says it right in our name, cooperative. It's like what people need to do on the whole planet is cooperate more. And we really love being able to be a visionary for that and mentor for that. Hi, Annie. Hey, Denise, how's it going? My name is Annie Gilliard. I live here in Walden, which is next to Hardwick. I work here at the Buffalo Mountain Food Co-op, a member-owned grocery store. We specialize in local and organic foods. Our co-op considers local within a 100-mile radius, but a lot of our products come from within about a 25-mile radius, and that would include tofu from Vermont soy. We have numerous, too many to mention, vegetable farmers, local cheesemakers like Jasper Hill, local seeds from high mowing seeds. It's local, local, local. About a quarter of our products are local. I feel that it's really important that people have the choice to buy food from local growers around here rather than having it shipped in from California, which is two weeks old by the time it gets here. The quality is much better and the taste, I feel, is much better as well. These are, these are Jubilees, which are crossed between, they're from the 40s, they cross between the team. My name is Bill Half, H-A-L-F. I'm a certified organic farmer from Walden, Vermont, and I'm here at the Hardwick Farmer's Market selling produce. There are a lot of small growers here and a lot of small producers. There's a lot of people that are making this community very vibrant. <laughs> See ya. Thanks for growing vegetables. Oh yeah, thanks for coming by to support the market. The most important thing for me is that people have access to food and good food at reasonable prices. And you know, one of the other things that's happened here in Hardwick is Claire's restaurant. Hi Steven. You know, Steven's a great chef. He's creative and he uses whatever we grow. My cooking style is what the farmers want to grow, what I want to cook, and what people want to eat. And it's really dictated by what, what's happening at the farm and what works for them. I am Stephen Obranovich. I'm the chef and one of the owners of Claire's Restaurant and Bar in Hardwick, Vermont. I cook for our community. The, the percentage of food that is grown locally that I use is anywhere from 70 to 85 percent. Okay, thank you. In the beginning, we had the big, great light bulb that occurred to us about doing a community-supported restaurant. 50 people, 50 to 60 people provided us with cash in a lump sum that then, over four years, they get to redeem a dollar amount against that initial contribution that they gave us. So they're getting their money back in that form and then they're also supporting us by coming in and dining in. And it's not, I, the majority of people that have the community supported restaurant certificates are coming in more than just for that allocation, which is great. And then they're telling, you know, 10 other people about it. So it becomes this, you know, this never ending cycle of goodwill. Anything that's left on diner's plates that they're not wanting to take away with them is put into that compost bucket. And the truck rolls up and takes it away, and we start the process all over again for another week. 
we call our programs close the loop programs because the composting is the end of and beginning of the food system. So we take that material that would have otherwise be destined for the landfill and put it back into production, taking that linear food system model and bending it back into the, the image of an ecosystem. My name is Tom Gilbert and I'm the executive director for the Highfield Center for Composting. Agriculture is one of our most significant sources of emissions. It's somewhere between 13 and 25 percent of our total emissions. And so uh, how we eat is a big piece to solving global warming. In Vermont, if we were to take all of our food scraps and take them out of the waste stream, the emissions offset would be equivalent to not burning somewhere around 12 or 13 million gallons of gas annually. That's a much simpler task than requiring Detroit to you know, get better fuel efficiency. Hey, you guys. Hey, Tom. What do you got there? We have pig parts. All right, you got some residuals. Should we throw them in the pile here? You just dump them right on the sawdust. We've tried to use as much as we possibly can of the pig. So this is just the intestines and the parts that we can't use. We use the small intestines for sausage, and the large intestines are in here. They're not usable. How'd your garden grow this year, Jennifer? It went so great. We were so pleased with the compost we got from here. It really added to the soil and we got some good vegetables out of it. I love the idea of having brought that compost to our place in the springtime and then grown our garden with it and then bring our waste here to go back into that cycle. To, you know, complete that circle. That felt really good for us. All right, well, we'll blend this right in with the rest of the food scraps and we can have it back in your garden next year. Yay, Great. we're really excited about that. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. I don't think anybody thinks about soil, to be entirely honest with you. I think we eat our food and we don't, we don't even think about the cow that the milk came from, let alone the soil that grew the grass that they, the cow ate. Uh, I think what we mostly don't know is how precious it is. So, we have just closed the food system. We, this is food scraps that came back here about nine months ago, and they're going back out to grow gardens and grow vegetables now, today. Um, food system closed. This is the stuff that keeps all life going. I mean, I'm, going, I'm giving seven talks in Canada next week about all of this. Like, the phone is ringing off the frickin' hook to, of people in communities all over the U.S. and Canada that are hungry for this kind of inspiration, these ideas, this story. Last summer when fuel was really high, our local co-op was spending more, it cost more to buy lettuce from California than it did to buy it locally. That had never happened before. Once that's the norm, this is, it's like a whole new world, all this stuff. This, all this local production stuff is no longer a niche. It is the new economy. And I think the reason that food and food systems are such an incredible opportunity for us to change not only climate issues but economic issues and social issues and water quality issues is because it forces us to sit down and have a conversation. It forces us to eat together. It forces us to participate with one another in resolving those issues. Obviously these lovely bananas are not local and we do like them but if it can be grown here locally let's do it. Let's not import food from other countries. Other countries that can't even feed their own people. Why are they sending food away? I think this can happen and is happening all over the country. Um, I think what, what we're so fortunate here in Hardwick is that we've gone to the next level of, of really collaborating um, and each business is working together f with the same common mission. I would think that this could happen all over the country. And really, it needs to. That's our program for tonight. From New York, for HDNet, Dan Rather reporting. Good night. If you would like to add your name to an email list for information on upcoming programs, or if you would just like to send a question or comment, please email us at 
viewer at hd.net.